good morning or good evening and the end of philosophy but I believe this philosophical in quotation mark of course philosophical introduction is very important because very often physicists that just uh, perform calculations and these calculations have nothing to do with real physics so to think about what those calculations really represent is important so today first of all i would like to show you a non uh, euclidean geometries and then we'll talk about uh, wave equations because wave equations the analysis mathematical analysis of wave equations is really uh, begin, beginning of general of relativity sorry both <laughs> general and special so I have already done uh, so Euclidean Geometry we have analyzed during last two lectures, but people have invented non-Euclidean geometry, and the key point was the question whether the last axiom of Euclid is independent or it follows from the first four axioms. Those four axioms, I'm not doing that because it is not uh, the lecture in, in geometry, it is more oriented towards physics. Uh, therefore, uh, I would like to give you a homework just to read a little bit to remind yourself what is Euclidean geometry. It is very easy to find also in, in Google Euclidean geometry and these five, uh, five um, axioms. And you will see that the first four axioms have something to do with parallel shift and all these was precisely uh, affine geometry we have which we have discussed so deeply and the fifth tells you that whenever you have a straight line and a point which is uh, which does not belong to this line then there is one and only one parallel yeah and people were very much convinced that the, because they were unable to to figure out how could it be that this axiom is not fulfilled but it is obvious that it can be the second uh, the second example is spherical spherical geometry which is just a, which became an important tool of politics because it enables to travel around the globe yeah when james cook the great uh, captain of british navy discovered australia new zealand and so on and so on he has to orient himself where he is and this was precisely spherical geometry in spherical geometry what are straight lines in quotation mark these are just great circles of the globe equator for instance is a straight line but of course there are many others yeah the big circles and if you just think a little bit you will see that the first two axioms, uh, sorry, the first four axioms of Euclid are fulfilled. Whereas the last axiom is not, because there are no parallel lines. Whenever you have two uh, great circles, either it is the same or they do intersect. So there are no parallel lines. Okay, now I would like to show you a certain 
a property of this spherical geometry, which you probably know because it depends which course of mathematics did you follow, you know probably that spherical geometry may be described in, uh, uh, by the projection by the projection, yeah? So, for instance, if you start project everything from the South Pole on, on to uh, uh, yeah? the, the plane, this is z equals zero plane, the points, let it be just unit sphere, yeah? Therefore, points of that mm, sphere are described by Cartesian coordinates, which fulfill the equation of the sphere, yeah? Equation of the sphere is x squared plus y squared plus z squared equal, let it be 1. I could uh, say 17 and it <laughs> could be equally good, but let it be 1. Which simply means that this is equal to 1 minus z yeah, that's square. Yeah, okay. And uh, and there is one to one correspondence between points of a sphere and points of this uh, plane. Yeah? And if we choose just coordinates on a plane, there are two of them. Let me call them Xi and Eta, okay? And now, what is important is that the, the, uh, the flat geometry of these two planes, this is just the plane which we know from the elementary geo uh, geometry, which you learn in elementary, at least I was, I was, uh, forced to study f flat geometry in elementary school, yeah, which you know perfectly. And I will prove, which is just a simple exercise, but I want to do it, that this geometry of a plane uh, z equals zero, flat plane and a sphere, are conformal, mutually conformal which simply means that if you measure uh, angles, so when, uh, whenever you measure them in the real geometry or in this fictitious flat geometry, the angles will be the same. Okay, so the, the story uh, is the following, that take Aha, I have told you that there is one-to-one -one correspondence between point of a sphere and the points of the, this flat plane, and this is not exactly true. It is one-to-one -one correspondence except one point, namely the South Pole, does not correspond, it corresponds to infinity. Yeah, because <laughs> this point, North Pole, is just is zero, but if we want to go there, then this point will tend to infinity. So in a sense, and it is obvious because there is no topological um, uh, isomorphism between sphere and the open plane. But if you uh, remove one point, then they are topologically equivalent. Okay, so the geometry of... Uh, ah, what I want to do, what is the relation between, uh, between Xi eta and those. And you see that there is a Thales law because they are 
to the ray angles which are similar, yeah? Similar, I don't know the English, uh, English, they are similar, yeah? They have the same angles, but, yeah? Therefore, there is Thales' uh, proportion, namely, that this Xi and eta two-dimensional vector is proportional to this x y yeah x y and what is the, the so xi or eta divided by one because this is one the radius is the same like x y divided by that and what is that it is one plus z yeah this is z okay one one plus z please control me is it true yeah xi or eta divided by one it is x or y divided by one plus zeta which simply means that the Cartesian geometry, the square of the length, d xi square plus d eta square, is d x over 1 minus z, but attention, z is not an independent parameter, but it is a function, plus d y divided by 1 minus z squared, yeah? Therefore, if we calculate that, ah, so better I will, be, I will begin with d xi is equal dx over 1 plus z and plus x 1 plus z square minus, yeah, because d, uh, yeah, dz. Right? Uh, because, uh, could you please explain the angles of theta and eta? Can you mark it on the figure? This is one, because this is radius. Radius of a sphere. I put it here. So it is a constant. So it is not angles. Yeah, pardon? It's not angles. Yeah. It is length. Uh, yeah, the length. Because theta is the radius of the yes. sphere, and eta? Uh, it, it is the length. X, Y, Z are in centimeters, for instance, and this is centimeter square, but mathematics. Oh, eta, eta. That means what? Uh, theta is, it is radius of uh, uh, radius of circle, and the eta. E, eta? Yeah, uh, you see, when looking, from above on this uh, plane, you have two coordinates on it. I call one of them xi, which is co correspond to x, and the other eta, which corresponds to y. So when I am looking from above, what I see? I see x, y on a sphere, and I see xi, eta on this plane which intersects the sphere, yeah? And of course they are proportional. They are not equal because, oh, because we do such a projection. Therefore this point is projected onto that point, yeah? Of course, these are two Thales laws because I may do it first in the uh, in a intersect everything in a plane eta equals zero, which means y equals zero. Then I get this, the first 
Yeah? And then I do it in, in this direction, which means that I intersect everything by the plane uh, x equals 0. And this way I obtain the second one. But, OK. In any case, this is correct. In a similar way, the eta is equal. I must differentiate that. So this is dy over 1 plus z plus y, uh, the differential of 1 over minus uh, 1 plus z. So this is minus, because if I differentiate 1 over something, that this is minus 1 over this something square times, yeah, so this is minus. Y remains, because it has already been differentiated, plus z square, uh, sorry, z square dz. OK. And now I am ready to calculate, finally, this, the distance. Uh, so I will do it in the following way. Each of this square is composed of three uh, um, terms, namely, the first square, the second square, minus twice um, their product, right? So first, let us take the squares of first two. So it will be dx squared plus dy squared divided by 1 plus z square. OK? So this is the sum of the first two terms. Now let us take the, uh, the, the sum of uh, squares of the second. So I will combine everything in the following intelligent way, namely, it will be x square and from the second one y square over square, so 1 plus z to the fourth power, yeah? By the way, when I did this uh, first time, this calculation, I made an error, I forgot I put twice and I was, and uh, I could not get the <laughs> result, but immediately I noticed it. And what remains is twice, minus remains, yeah, twice 2x times d, ah, sorry, dz square, d z square, now minus 2x dx, so it is first times second, 1 plus z, and which power? This is in, in, uh, the product, yeah? So third power, yeah? because we multiply further, and from the second, you obtain the same 2y dy. Yeah. And times dz. Therefore, I will put this dz outside of the bracket. Oh, okay. This is the way how I proceed. And now, observe that 2x dx is dx squared, plus 2y dy is dy squared. Right? Therefore, this I may, uh, I will not. OK, so this is equal to, no, I'm going to calculate this 
this bracket. So this bracket this bracket is x squared plus y squared because it everything happens on a on a sphere yeah therefore the first term it is 1 minus z square over 1 plus z and force power dz now minus d x square plus y square over 1 plus z to the power of 3. Okay? But what is d of x square plus plus 1? This is d of 1 minus z square because we remember that we are on a sphere, right? Therefore, this is 1 when differentiated gives nothing and this is minus 2z dz, yeah? So instead of that, let me use this unfair procedure that this is no, this everything is equal to minus 2z dz, right? Okay? Okay. Which finally gives me, so I have dz, uh, which I may put outside of the bracket, and in the bracket, now, what is 1 minus z squared? This is 1 minus z times 1 plus z. So this 1 plus z finally uh, interacts with that. So I will have 1 minus z over Oh, so maybe the common, because 1 plus z to the power 3. And what I get here is minus and minus, this will be plus 2z and dz is outside. So finally this is 1 plus z over one. So finally, it is nothing but dx square plus dy square plus dz square divided by 1 plus z square. You see it? Because this is 1 plus z square. So finally, what did we obtain? We obtained that this is the length, or rather square of the length, on, on, on that um, flat plane, whereas this is the length, the measure of the length on a sphere. On a sphere, when we measure distances, we just measure that. And they are proportional. If they are proportional, it means that the angles are the same. So the mapping from, uh, maybe you, when I was that size approximately, I were, was fascinated by geography and for instance different 
uh, geographical charts were very interesting. And of course, when you map something which is curved on a, a sheet of paper which is flat, it is highly non-trivial. And there are different, different uh, projections, Mercator, different ones. This one is another one. And some of them were conformal. Some of them tried to, um, to represent nicely the, the distances. Of course, it is never possible, but roughly speaking. And uh, especially those conformal are important because they represent correctly angles. So this is precisely, so we say that these two uh, metric structure, structures, namely the spherical metric structure, the real metric structure on a sphere, and the metric structure uh, on, on this plane are conformal, because one of them is proportional to the other. This is very important. Uh, this, this, is, this exercise is a little bit unfair uh, within my present lecture because, <laughs> because I did not introduce the notion of the metric and so on and so on on flat, but surely you, you know it a little bit. I only wanted to show you that Spherical geometry is, in a sense, conformal with the flat Euclidean geometry. Because the, the last point will be hyperbolic geometry. So what is hyperbolic geometry? First I will tell you... Uh, geometrically. So there are many, those of you who know Minkowskian geometry, and of course you know, so for instance the uh, mass shell, the mass shell carries a hyperbolic geometry. Yeah? So if you take here x, y, z, and here t, and I will discuss this Minkowskian geometry in details, but now I would like only to, to tell you some insight. Here is a light cone, and here is a mass shell, as people say. Therefore, this is um, a surface which is given by the following that x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus t squared is equal is constant. Now this constant can be 17 as before but I will just put one one of them yeah which simply means that similarly as, as as in the spherical example, instead we may say is equal one uh, uh, but now not minus but plus. And this makes a big difference. Oh, uh, I should probably <laughs> I should probably take x, y and z there because <laughs> this is uh, just to represent the same, because now you see that T represents the same quantity as that. The only difference is that here geometry is not Euclidean, but this pseudo-Euclidean, Minkowskian. Yeah? And then again, we may project everything on, on, on that. And the internal geometry is a hyperbolic geometry. And it is very easy to say, uh, to, to see that 
Yeah, so we project everything on this flat yeah, t equal one surface. <coughs> And it turns out that this geometry is again conformal with that. Of course, with this flat geometry. It is not flat, but it is conformal, which means that the internal geometry on this hyperboloid is proportional to the flat geometry of its projection on a flat on a, on a flat however of course this geometry was discovered in a completely different way this hyperbolic geometry is very often called wobachevsky wo ba sorry wo -ba. Lubachevsky was a great Russian uh, geometer, mathematician. So this geometry is called after his name. But it seems that independently it was also discovered by a British geometer whose name I have forgotten. Excuse me. In any case, I will... Uh, I will present it to you in the following way that it is a half sphere of uh, sorry, half um, plane take uh, a plane uh, yeah, so a half plane Here we have x, here we have y. And this, roughly speaking, the way uh, this geometry was presented in 19th century. But I have chosen this type of representation because it is the <laughs> easiest one without uh, going directly into a similar calculations, but later on, at the end of my lecture, so we, within two months or something like that, I will perform the same kind of calculations uh, on the uh, mass hy hyperboloid, and you will see that it is equivalent, but today I, I want only to so what are in this and in this geometry we define straight lines and in fact this straight line are really geodesic lines the shortest line on a hyperboloid but nowadays you may <laughs> uh, I do not prove that this is true but I will prove it later so the straight lines are, are circles, but only those circles which are uh, orthogonal to, to this axis. And it may, you may uh -huh, include, so for instance, if you cho choose a straight line which start from, fra starts from here, then of, of course, oh, no. And so, so f for example, uh, but from one point you may choose bigger and bigger ones, yeah. And um, the limiting case of such a sphere, if the sphere is very big, then finally the limiting case is a real straight line which is orthogonal. So such a line is considered as a sphere with infinite radius. 
Yeah? So all the um, circles which are orthogonal to the x-axis, including this limiting case, which is a, a circle with an infinite radius, are declared to be straight lines in my hyperbolic geometry. And you may check, it would be nice if you could spend just 10 minutes in trying to understand this, that this collection of lines nicely ful fulfills the Euclidean axioms. And now you see that the, uh, in spherical geometry there were no parallel lines, whereas here there is too many lines. Because if you take any point, then you may, for instance, take such a line which is parallel to that in the sense that it does not intersect. But there are many others. Yeah, for instance, this one and that one. And finally, this, this one. A lot of them. Also, you may take something which goes like that, and much bigger. So you see that the fifth axiom of Euclid is not fulfilled because there are, when you have straight line and a point, there are infinitely many lines which do not intersect. And one, none of them can be declared to be parallel because there is, they are equally good, all of them. So there are no parallel or too, too many, too many. So in spherical geometry, no parallel lines, whereas here too many parallel lines. And I will stop here because I will uh, come back to that and we will analyze carefully the geometry of, of uh, mass shell and yeah. Wait a moment, did I? Yeah. Okay, so now I now I pass to to the next item of my talk, it, namely the wave equations. Because some people say that relativity is the, what is the essence of relativity? Many people say Lorentz transformations. But Lorentz transformations has been introduced by many people before Lorentz because it is just a mathematical um, property of uh, wave equations. And because we, we physicists, we meet wave equations in the description of X many, many physical phenomena, then it is very important to analyze this wave equation and its properties. Okay, so wave equation. I will begin with the so-called string equation, which means wave equation in which is in two-dimensional space-time the quotation marks Okay. 
Okay, so I have a one dimensional medium which can be string or maybe an elastic rod, something like that, and that does describe small vibrations. I have chosen for, uh, for, for you an easiest <laughs> setup, namely the longitudinal vibration. In fact, uh, perpendicular vibrations are described by the same thing, but the approximation, because after all, it is a nonlinear pro processus. It is only linear in the first approximation, because every medium at the beginning is linear. Yeah, the formation is proportional to the force, but when the force is extremely big, then it becomes nonlinear. And of course, this nonlinear, I will <coughs> remain on the level of linear approximations. So, for in linear approximation, also perpendicular deformations are described by the same equation, but the approximation is more difficult. So, I have chosen easier version. Okay, so therefore, this is an, uh, an iron rod, rod, very long rod, and it, for instance, lays here, and we take a hammer, and we do like that, then therefore the beginning of the rod will be deformed, and this deformation will propagate, and we want to describe how do these propagations propagate along the road. Okay, so you see that when we deform the road, what happens? What happens? There will be a tension which is induced in the rod. What is the tension? What is, what is physically, what is the tension? Huh. It is an internal force, yeah? That when I... What does it mean, for instance, that the tension is there, zero? There is no tension. What does it mean? It means that if I cut it, then both parts remain on the uh, at the same position. They do not move. This means that there, there was no tension. And what, is, what does it mean that, that there is a tension? It means that if I cut, then each of those uh, parts has a tendency to change its if the uh, either they both will try to uh, to move in this direction or in that direction yeah therefore the tension has a sign actually it is a vector but here <laughs> in one dimension the vector is just a, a number, yeah? But it has a sign. So finally, what is a tension? A tension can be understood as a force which is necessary to maintain the uh, position of the road when we cut it. But of course now, which force? Because before cutting it, nothing moves. Because a tension which left part exerts on the right part, but also there is a tension that the right part exerts on the left part. Yeah? So here we have to 
to make a, um, um, the definition or to make a convention in which because you can say attention is in both sides yeah because this part acts on that part or this part acts on that part and as a measure of tension we have to choose one of them so for instance let us choose as a tension we choose the force uh, by which the right part acts on the left part. Yeah? So this is just a convention. We could choose different convention, but this is just a convention to make uh, calculations. Yeah? Okay. So this tension, let me call it D, the tension. Now, before uh, uh, my action with uh, the hammer, uh, the rod was in a perfect equilibrium. There was no tension. And we may parameterize points of the, of the rod by its position in this equilibrium situation, yeah? So let us choose a tiny small segment of this road, yeah? But this is in, in equilibrium. And now the displacement of this Point. So every uh, point has got his name, and it may be written on a on a rod. I am George. I am Mary. Yeah. The name is somehow glued to to a point. And now to describe the dynamical situation, we we want to say how much, uh, how big is the displacement. So the phi of x, but also, also of the time, because it changes, is the displacement. Now, of course, again, we have to choose some convention because the displacement, if you want to parameterize by real numbers, the minus will be in a different direction and so on. So we have to, so for instance, let the displacement in the direction of, of, of the right hand will be positive and so on. Having chosen those um, conventions, everything is okay. So this is just a displacement. And now we know the hook law. What is hook law? That the force proportional to the relative uh, elongation. So, yeah. So the what is L zero. Ah, this is delta x. Yeah, and now what is uh, L? The actual this position is uh, x plus phi. Yeah, so after the deflation, it will be x. I will omit the letter tau because we understand that everything will depend upon time and it will be very important but at the moment if we fix some instant of time this is x plus phi of x whereas 
Yeah, so this is the, and this is x plus delta x plus phi of x plus delta x. Yeah, so these are those two positions. So the actual, the actual um, length at a, ti at a fixed time t during the, this dynamical process is this minus that, yeah? So this is delta x plus phi of x plus delta x minus phi of x, yeah? And in a linear, in a linear approximation, where all those deformations are small, we replace this by the derivative, but derivative with respect to the x variable, yeah? So, which is equal d phi over dx. So this is i times delta x. So finally, it is delta x times one plus five prime, you know? Okay. So finally, D is a, uh, how is it called, hook constant? No, it is not hook. Uh, oh, I forgot. H times, um, delta L, L zero, yeah? What is delta L? This is delta x times phi prime. So it is h times phi prime derivative. Of course, this is just the linear law. So this is one. So all that which I have written is a hook law. So this is the first ingredient. And the second ingredient is the uh, um, second Newton law, yeah? So again, we take this tiny piece of, of the metal, and so this is the first ingredient. And the second ingredient is second Newton. No, which is F equal M times uh, acceleration, yeah? So first, what is the, the force which acts here? So if we, again, se um, mentally separate this small uh, interval of, uh, of, of no? so w which forces acts here? Ah, there is d of x plus dx here. So this part tries to move in this direction, whereas this d moves 
in, in the opposite direction, yeah? Because the tension here is d of x, however, it, according to our uh, convention, it acts in the opposite side, yeah? So, f is, so f acting on this part of a, of a string, of a string or, or, of, or a road is nothing but dx plus dx. This is tension which tries to uh, move it rightwards minus d of x. Yeah, because it is a tension which tries to move leftwards. We, and again, we use this linear approximation. We assume that all these deformations are small. Therefore, it is nothing by d prime of x times delta x. So this is force. Now, what is A? No, no, first M. What is M? M is rho, which is some proper density. How many grams or kilograms or whatever per unit of length, yeah? So it is mass per length. And of course, if the rod is not homogeneous, that it becomes more complicated. But now assume that it is homogeneous, that every point it has the same rho times the length. Yeah? Rho is mass, well, which is delta x. And now what is A? A is simply the velocity. When x is fixed, what is f x? x is this label which has been uh, glued to that point. So the motion of this point is fully described by the, the, the dependence up, upon the time. So its velocity is first derivative with respect to time, and its acceleration is a second de derivative, yeah? Therefore, A is nothing by phi. I will put those two dots. This is, <laughs> of course, only, uh, which is simply the second derivative over d square of phi, yeah? I will use this notation that dot means time derivative whereas prime means space derivative. Okay, so now what remains is to plug uh, to plug uh, the hook law within uh, within the, the Newton law. Yeah? So we have d prime, but d is here. So we, uh, so the Newton's law is h times derivative of the derivative is simply second derivative. So this is uh, left hand side, the force equal to mass uh, sorry, times, of course, I forgot, um, delta x. <coughs> yeah, because there is delta x here. And on the right hand side, mass, which is rho delta x, times phi second derivative with respect. And now we see that our approach is reasonable. Why it is reasonable? Because this delta x, of course, it would not be reasonable if our procedure depends upon the choice of, of this small 
tiny interval which we have chosen. Of course, fortunately, the, this choice does not play any role because it drops out. And finally, we obtain, uh, maybe I will write it like that, phi prime equal rho over h uh, phi double dot or I prefer to write it this way uh, 1 over h over rho oh. d square over d t square phi oh. why this way because <laughs> being partially a mathematician I hate keeping constants in uh, equations because the, just a cons constant which can be consumed namely we can, we can marry this constant I will call this quantity C square which means that I have defined the con uh, V as square root of H over R and now this T with T is again a measure of time but in different units you can say yeah so finally I have such a, an equation that d2 over dx square minus I will put it on the other side d2 over dt uh, sorry not t I will call it tau acting on a function phi equals zero where I have defined this new time equal c times t it is what is this time? Uh, this tau, uh, you say you call it in English tau, yeah, tau. In Polish we say tau. This is a Greek letter. I have given you this Greek alphabet. This is again a measure of time, but in different units. What does it mean? Namely, these units are both have the same uh, th th these two quantities, namely um, this space distance and time lapse are now you, uh, measured in the same unit, namely for instance in centimeter. What is one centimeter of time? Ah, it is a uh, time which this wave needs to move by one centimeter yeah so this is precisely what the astronomers do because they measure uh, distances in light years for instance yeah and this is precisely the same I hate uh, such uh, formulae that there are those gravitational force C etc because I always say to my colleagues that the scientists have measured C with a very big accuracy and it is precisely one because in fact of course this is a joke but it simply means that because it doesn't change it is universal therefore we may uh, marry it with a time which means that we can measure time in meters yeah. and of course here this c is not the, the light velocity it is a velocity of those deformations <laughs> okay and this um, uh, operator this is a second uh, second order differential operator this is called a wave operator now I am an 
uh, how you say um, when I was young I w w wanted to become a musician I have uh, spent a lot of time in studying music and so on and so on and I say you that all the uh, uh, instruments including for instance string instruments where the deformations are not are also longitudinal but perpendicular also fulfill this equation now if you don't uh, uh, use too much force on your violin, then uh, this uh, linear approximation is su sufficient. So the entire music is based on this uh, on this equation. Ah, I know now what I wanted to say. I wanted to say that I am not non-fulfilled musician. Oh. I am a non-fulfilled musician. Okay, and we are going to study the mathematical properties of this operator because they are this is much older than just gen, uh, relativity theory, and relativity theory can be considered as a certain observation about uh, properties of the wave equation. Now I want to uh, um, to repeat a similar for a similar procedure, namely to derive uh, the three-dimensional wave equation as a propagation of sound either in elastic media or in I will remain on the level of of the a liquid liquid which is either gas or or a Water is what? Liquid, yeah. Yeah, either gas or, or liquid. Non-elastic, because in elastic media it is slightly different because <coughs> there are different kinds of waves and they can have two different uh, velocities. But we may separate them, therefore, again, everything uh, reduces just to a, a wave equation, but there are two different waves. So, in three-dimensional medium, this operator will be replaced by the Laplace, Laplace operator. And again, this uh, Operator, uh, so Einstein has invented this uh, notation because four dimensions, but okay, but could be plus in four dimensions, but it is not plus, but but minus. So I will show you that the sound propagates according to this to this uh, equation. Okay, so let me... So I, uh, because of this story with, with the camera, we have started slightly later, so as you probably noticed, I didn't make any break, so let us do it without break, uh, just one hour and a half, two. Okay, so I... We'll try to... So in... 
in order to be not to forget anything let me permit me to just to keep my notes because ah I forgot excuse me the list just put the date 8 uh, March yeah It is just okay. So first, so we we describe small deformations of. Uh, um, equilibrium state of the so, so suppose before we enter this uh, this uh, room the earth was homogeneously distributed there was some pressure which we may call p0 there was some uh, density which was constant, everything was constant. Um, by the way, we may also um, describe something by 1 over rho, which is often called the proper, uh, proper uh, volume. This measures how, man, how much uh, liquid or airs per unit of volume, and this measures how much volume per unit of of uh, one mole, for instance, of of, the, of a liquid. In any case, the, there is again a kind of a hook law, namely that uh, pressure is um, an analog of, of the um, tension, D. Because what is pressure? It is just a force per a unit surface which right-hand side acts on the left-hand side. And of course, uh, with an opposite force, the left-hand side acts on, on the right-hand side. So this is a force. And again, we have a uh, hook law, which can be def uh, defined that uh, uh, yeah. It was D equal uh, DL over L uh, times the constant. And it is the same here. Uh, it is the Okay, now the liquid or a gas is, of course, a nonlinear medium. But we will consider only small deformations because what happens, as I told you, before we entered here, the pressure and the, uh, the density were constant, and now they slightly differ. So. <coughs> the small change of the because here of course I can also say delta and the small change of the uh, of the pressure is minus h small change of the proper volume over volume or plus H 
delta rho over rho. No. This minus, of course, you understand because when the proper volume gets bigger, then it means that the pressure will be smaller. But at the same time, the density will be, if the proper volume is bigger, then the proper density is smaller. Yeah. So everything is, is all right. Ah, maybe, maybe I don't need this part. Let me, probably it, it is just sufficient if I use the density. Okay, so this is first ingredient, the hook. So of course, what I'm doing here is not very deep from the uh, point of view of thermodynamics because uh, studying thermodynamics, you can uh, nicely uh, calculate this H in terms of this um, thermodynamical quantities, Boltzmann temperature and so on, and also uh, the adiabatic unit enters into the game. <coughs> But roughly speaking, this is like that. So now at the moment we don't need to know deeper, nothing deeper about this quantity. It is sufficient that we know that these two are proportional and this is precisely the analog of this one-dimensional hook law. Now, the second ingredient is the following, namely that, okay, the, if we choose mentally, again, mentally, nothing can, have, uh, can depend upon this choice. Let me call it a, the volume then the mass contained in this volume is nothing but the integral over V dV. Yeah? Therefore, the, the change of the mass per unit time is nothing but rho dot dv. Yeah? So this is nothing as well. But now, what enters now is a very important, namely the law of conservation of a matter. Namely, why the mass contained in uh, in this volume changes. We assume that no matter has been killed. Therefore, if it changes, it is only due to, to the uh, to the uh, current of the matter. Some matter uh, escapes on the other hand, some can enter, and we have to integrate the total amount of matter, yeah? So, so this change, this is conservation of matter, conservation. So, this equality is a matter conservation. And this is minus, or minus is a convention, because usually we um, consider J to be positive is if it is, uh, goes outside. Then of course if it goes outside, so it contributes uh, with a negative side to, to rho square, yeah? 
So how much, uh, how much, so this means, what, what, uh, so this is, <coughs> what is this current? And this is nothing but rho times velocity times velocity, yeah? This is the current, because this... So, to calculate how much, uh, how much uh, matter escaped, so we have to project this current rho times velocity onto a normal onto a normal and integrate over the uh, the boundary of this volume with respect to the surface measure yeah no, of course, because this is just, we calculate how much matter, why this projection? Because if the matter moves parallelly to the border, then nothing escapes. So what really counts is this perpendicular projection, of course, yeah? The uh, perpendicular to the surface. So from the very beginning, the longitudinal towards, uh, with respect to the surface doesn't count. What counts is only this perpendicular direction, and perpendicular is just the projection. This is scalar product, yeah? This is unit vector, normal vector, normal to the surface. And of course, you know the Gauss, Green, Gostrogradsky, and so on theorem, which tells you that such a uh, surface integral may is equal to some volume integral from the divergence divergence of this current over dv. And this happens for any, uh, excuse me, excuse me, this, because I had a tendency to call volume V, but I, <laughs> I have changed it to O because V I have used for velocity, excuse me. So if this, equality keeps for any volume O, this means that those two functions must be, oh no, sorry, what did I do? So, uh, excuse me, this is not equal, this is equal, minus, oh, sorry, excuse me, M is equal that, but now we are calculating the changes of M, and the change of M is equal to, is equal to minus that, which is equal to minus, oh, excuse me, excuse me. In any case, what we have discovered is that rho square is equal minus divergence of rho v. This is a continuity equation which you probably know from some physics. The same equation, you may, so this is the j, for instance, this equation is very important electro, in electrodynamics. This is just current, uh, no, uh, the charge conservation. Here, there is the 
mass conservation or matter conservation. No, conser no matter has been killed. If rho changes, it means that some of this matter has escaped. But no matter is killed. So this is so this point two may be called matter conservation law. Okay. And finally, the third, the last ingredient of our derivation. I come to the end, don't be afraid, I will not be uh, is again this um, yeah, so the the last point is the uh, Newton's law. Second law, namely again F equal M times A. <coughs> But I will do it the following way, that Newton's law plus called a law which I can call Archimedes. What is Archimedes law? You, you know that if you uh, take a bath, then your body becomes lighter because there is this, uh, yeah. And this Archimedes law is nothing but the observation that the force which acts from on this part, so we select artificially or mentally the, this part of the, of the gas, and we observe we, what is the force, external force. And of course, at each point, there is this force which is given by the pressure. And if we combine everything, then this Archimedes law is simply that the force is given by the gradient of of the pressure and of course times the volume uh, yeah times the volume yeah. this is the Archimedes law so this is Ah, I should probably write them in the opposite direction because I have written first the Archimedes law. For, for example, this is precisely Archimedes law because when you take a bath, the gradient of a pressure, the hydrodynamical uh, pressure, is proportional to the z-axis. Z Therefore, the gradient it is constant and times the... No. So this is the force. Uh, and this is equal, so this is Archimedes. Archimedes. And this is Newton. So this is the mass. What is mass? This is rho times delta V. Oh, so, sorry, excuse me. Volume. No. Or maybe, ah, excuse me. In fact, I, I should not do vol times, I will write down volume. Volume. So the mass is again rho times volume. 
and velocity a. So again, we are very happy this, that our mental invention, namely the volume of the thought, drops out. So what remains is that the gradient of P is equal rho times A. And what is A? It is second derivative of the... You have seen we, ha we had the velocity here. So the uh, A is just velocity dot. And that's having those two laws, we plug one of them into the other. Yeah. So in order to calculate that, we have to obtain the second derivative. Yeah. So we calculate the second derivative, therefore rho two squares is equal when we minus divergence of and now I have to calculate the time derivative of this quantity but but V is small rho is not small but the derivative of rho is small because we uh, assume that all those changes are tiny. Therefore, if I c put the derivative of rho here, I will be, uh, this will be second order term, because it will be something which is small times small. Therefore, I may drop it out in the linear. Therefore, what remains is rho times v dot. Right? Of course, this is the linear approximation. Rho is not small, but rho dot is small. And now we plug in this Archimedes plus Newton's law here, so we obtain minus Sorry. There is something that What happened with my... Because if I, if I plug it, yeah, I obtain what? Divergence of a gradient of an P, P uh, of P So this is nothing. Divergence of a, a gradient, you know what is. It is a Laplacian. Now, P uh, Excuse me. Small changes of P are uh, wait a moment, wait a moment. Oh, 
I know where there is a, because this minus is, is, is wrong, of course. There should be plus. Now, excuse me, excuse me. No minus here, plus. Because zero. Oh, I am afraid I have to. So something is wrong. In, in any case, if I plug in P, then it will be minus, but this minus is probably wrong. Uh, H over rho and the Laplace, Laplacian of rho zero, Laplacian of rho. Yeah. There should be plus here. So please. Here, maybe minus sign? Because zero, uh, then new. No minus sign. Here must be I mean, the, the, plus sign. The, the first, the second, uh, the uh, gradient P times the volume equal rho times the volume times the acceleration. So, for example, if you have put some volume inside water... Ah, you are right. Of course, of course. Force is a minus... Then that is direction, uh, the change of the pressure is actually uh, negative because it's going this way, but the gravitational force is the opposite way, so you can't have to cancel. Go. So that must be, there must be negative sign. Here? Yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Excuse me. Yeah. Because this is compensating yeah. force. Yeah, because this is correct, yeah. Yeah. Because this okay. is general equation. This is like low that plus divergence low V is uh, equal to zero is uh, conservation of mm -hmm. any, uh, conservation. No, yeah, this is correct. Mm -hmm. This one actually uh, change your pressure from bottom to up. You are like smaller pressure going upward. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, my Almost 58, almost 60 years of experience of a lecturer tells me that I should stop here and next time I will. In any case, there is a minus, uh, there is an error here because the correct uh, is. No. The correct result should be plus here. Okay, I will repair it during the next, next time. So finally, we have Laplacian minus d2 over dt square. And again, we have this h over rho. This operator acting on rho equals zero. And again, this quantity will be called uh, one over c square. Yeah. Is wrong. No. Okay, but I, I, I'm not going to spend too much of your time. In any case, if I uh, I have a tendency to call it h over rho, if I call c equals square root of h over rho, then uh, and tau equal c t, then 
Yeah. Then the final result is minus d2 over d tau square of rho equals zero. So this is our final equation and during the next talk I will analyze mathematical properties of these equations. Excuse me, I will correct this yeah, the, because this would be a, a, a nonsense. This would be a nonsense. Without this minus sum, this would be a nonsense. This must be a minus here. Thank you very much. <laughs>